to introduce our speaker, who is Lee Dennison, who has had a military career featuring time in military intelligence and other things that he probably would not be able to tell us about unless he were to kill us. The but his viewpoint on uh, various aspects of the war have been both enlightening and very sophisticated. Uh, Lee has one of the best grasps of the larger view, I think, of any of our of our speakers. The present topic is about the German general staff, which started with the Treaty of Westphalia and ended in the Peace of Versailles, and then was promptly uh, prohibited in the Versailles Treaty, and then was copied by every other country in the world, including Germany itself. So, that somewhat convoluted introduction, uh, Lee, it, the, the floor is yours. Okay, now, whoops. A German general staff at the end of the 19th century was pretty much admired around the world as for its efficiency and effectiveness. Not always approved of, but admired. One commentator called it one of the five perfect organizations in Europe, the other four being the Paris Opera, the Russian Ballet, the Papal Curia, and the British Parliament. So that's pretty high-end stuff. And yet, less than uh, a quarter century later, we find this in the Treaty of Versailles. Now, the question is, what made it so good, and why did the Allies feel they had to drive a stake in its heart? And to find the roots of this thing, we have to go back to the 17th century and the Thirty Years' War that ran around in the territory of what was then called the Holy Roman Empire, and were specifically interested in the state of Brandenburg, Prussia. Brandenburg being the home of the Hohenzollern family before their kings, and Prussia being a piece that they acquired by marriage not long before the war started. Now, the war itself took the heart out of Brandenburg. About 50% of its population was lost. And in 1640, when this man inherited the rule of the place, he had a problem on his hands. In those days, if you wanted a big field army, except for the very largest and richest countries, you had to hire it. You could either contract with local bigwigs to raise regiments for you, or you could rent mercenary organizations, and being a mercenary was big business back then. What Friedrich Wilhelm von Hohenzollern decided was that he didn't trust all of these outside sources of security. He wanted it in his own hands. So he begins founding a standing army. Starts small, but it grows over time. And he turns out to be not just a very vigorous uh, ruler, but also a very effective general. And by the time he gets to the end of his life, 48 years after he takes over, He's got an army of someplace between 20 and 30,000. The uh, sources differ. That's very effective, and he has used it very, very well. Now, he also has a staff. Now, this is not what we would call a general staff in the modern sense, an organization that plans wars and uh, helps run them. It's more of a support staff. He's got a quartermaster general. In English, that usually means the supply guy, but for Friedrich Wilhelm, it's the guy who's responsible for fortified places, for routes of march, for troop quartering. General Auditeur was the military lawyer. There were two adjutants general who were the, the uh, king's direct uh, assistants and secretaries, uh, somewhat more than an aide and somewhat less than a chief of staff. Paymaster general, commissary general, wagon master general are pretty obvious. The enforcer general, I love the title, he's the military policeman. 
and the Master General of Ordnance is supposed to be the senior of all of them. It appears to be a title that generally went to one of the king's senior field commanders, almost more honorific than functional. Uh, but the planning and direction of a war entirely falls within the hands of the king himself and such of his senior commanders as he wants to bring into it. These people don't do that. And if war is not actually going on, some of these positions may not even be filled and active at any particular time. You bring them on, you'll have them, give them a job while it's necessary, and then they go away. Now, Friedrich's son is just Friedrich. You will find that the Hohenzollerns have no imagination at all in naming elder sons. They're Friedrich Wilhelm or Friedrich Wilhelm. And this guy is not much of a general compared to his father. He uses the army to do favors, loans troops to the Holy Roman Emperor and to others. And between that and greasing a lot of palms with silver, he gets permission in 1701 to crown himself a king, the king in Prussia, because supposedly he can only so call himself a king in his Prussian possessions and not back in Brandenburg. But king is a more important title than being elector of Brandenburg, and it doesn't take long before the whole thing gets to be called just the kingdom of Prussia. Now, he is followed by his son, Friedrich Wilhelm I. Uh, he's a king, so he gets a number. He's called in German history the Soldatenkönig, the soldier king. Not because he was much of an active general, he wasn't, but because the army is his obsession. Now, he drills his army, he expands it uh, from 30,000 that he gets from his father to about 80,000. The discipline is almost violent at times. Uh, he introduces the goose step, by the way, and a few ideas that apply later. First of all, the king as the Oberste Kriegsherr, the supreme warlord. Uh, the king has always been in charge. Now it's codified and in the king's titles. It's obvious that the army is the king's instrument. Nobody else is in charge of it, and it answers to him and him only. Secondly, the idea of Prussian obedience. Uh, particularly if you're at the lower levels in the Prussian army, if you get an order, you obey it. There's no questions asked. There's no relief uh, of any kind from obedience. And if you don't obey, the consequences are considerable. And finally, well, this is something that's been a lot around for a while. His grandfather had made a deal with the Prussian nobility that uh, raised more taxes to support the army. They got some privileges from it. But now Friedrich Wilhelm I requires the nobility to serve as officers in the army. And again, there's no relief from it. Uh, this produces what gets called the Junkers. Uh, the title on the picture, by the way, if you can't read it, says an officer of the guard battalion. Now, the term actually refers to the East Prussian landed nobility. And we've got to be careful of that landed nobility term because it tends to make people here in the U.S. think about British nobility. You know, great uh, country houses, huge estates, lots of wonderful money coming into the landowners. That ain't the way it is for the Junkers. These people may be land rich, they're money poor. East Prussia is lousy agricultural land. One commentator says that the primary agricultural product of East Prussia is sand. The people that work the estates are serfs, little better than slaves, and with no particular reason to do good work. The result is the Junkers are money poor. Uh, one British commentator called them ridiculously poor. And once they get into the army, well, if you're a younger son of one of the Junker families, the army is your only chance of survival. And what you have to live on is 
the money that you get in your salary from the king. Now, these days in much of the British Army, uh, there were many regiments where you had to have an outside income in order to be able to be an officer, because the expense of being an officer was greater than your salary. It's the reverse for the Junkers in the Prussian Army. Ethnically, they're a Germanized mixture. There are Junker families that date all the way back to the Prussian tribes of the Middle Ages. There are, of course, German families. There are Polish families. There are even French Huguenot families that were invited in because they were uh, repopulating parts of Germany, uh, and they were able to avoid religious persecution at home. But they were all very Germanized at culturally. They made effective, if somewhat limited, officers. The king provided cadet schools that prepared these young sons for the army, but didn't really give them much of a broad education beyond this is what you got to do to become an officer. Some obviously rose, but the senior ranks of the Prussian army tended to be there because they were either members of the king's family or parts of some of the greater noble families, uh, rather than because of any particular great ability in education. Their loyal to the, the loyalty to the king was fanatic. Their oaths as officers were to the king, not to the state, and to the king personally. They knew that their employment, their survival was dependent on the king who had given them the education they needed to be officers. And now if they were going to eat, they had to be loyal. They were highly entitled. They considered themselves the peak of Prussian society. They were completely uninterested in doing much mixing with any of this middle caste bourgeois uh, group. They were almost by law prohibited from taking part in normal business activities, so there was no outlet from being an officer. Uh, and it produced a, an arrogance that later gets called Prussianism. And finally, their interests were narrow. They tended to be, it was described as the officer's mess, tobacco, cards, and port, and not much else. Cultural things were something outside their area of interest at all. Now, that actually caused a lot of problems between Friedrich Wilhelm and his eldest son, who, as it turned out, was interested in music, literature, and art, to the point that it caused great conflict. And as he was getting to the end of his life, Friedrich Wilhelm really worried whether or not his son would be at all a success as a Prussian king which is one of the most ironic things around, because his son is Frederick the Great, one, one of the great captains of uh, history. He takes over in 1740, builds the Prussian army from about 80,000 that his father had to over 200,000, attacks all of his neighbors, expands his lands considerably by force of arms, and generally does quite a job of producing a reputation for the Prussian army as being the most effective in Europe. Now, Frederick himself has the same staff structure, basically, that his uh, great-grandfather had established. Uh, he uses a few very effective senior commanders, Seidlitz and a few others, as his core uh, of advisors, but military decisions are entirely within his hands. He is unquestionably the Oberste Kriegsherr. Uh, Frederick is also gay. He has no children of his own, so his successor has to deal with the French Revolution. Now, of course, the French revolutionary armies don't play by the rules of Frederican warfare. The, the uh, Prussian army was trained three ranks of uh, musketeers in rigid linear tactics. Uh, you get your success by maneuvering faster and shooting faster than anybody else, whereas French revolutionary armies come at you with clouds of voltageurs, 
skirmishers ahead of the main body who consistently moved around and didn't hold still to be shot. And when they attacked, it wasn't in line, but in mass groups of infantry, perhaps 15, 20 ranks deep, with the aim of blowing through these uh, ranks uh, and uh, then rolling them up. A serious problem, and one that armies had a hard time dealing with. Now, Wilhelm's successor is his nephew, Friedrich Wilhelm II, takes over before the French Revolution, but then his early reign has changed and knocked around because he has to deal with the French. Now, he doesn't really want to be a general. He enjoys being a king, and that's what he wants to do. So he sets up something called the Oberkriegskollegium, composed entirely of uh, senior commanders from the end of Frederick's reign. It was good enough for old Fritz. We'll keep doing it the same way. And their job is to take their things military while he deals with being a king. The adjutant general's department is still around. At this point, it's begun to deal primarily with personnel matters, but is also the advisor and secretary to the king with what he does militarily. And most of the other functions have now come under something that's called the quartermaster general's department. But one thing he does do is open up a set of spaces for engineer geographers, uh, map makers something relatively new in armies of the day. And these are all middle-class people, because, of course, working with colored pencils and drawing pens and large pieces of paper is entirely below the dignity of a Junker. So this is one of the first ways that non-noble officers begin to work their way into the Prussian army. Not a lot of them, but they're there. Now, he, in turn, is replaced by Friedrich Wilhelm III, who is the, the great nephew. Now, he is a man who is known for primarily being not particularly self-confident and being, at the same time, rather uh, diffident and not decisive at all. But he's smart enough, when he looks at his army, to recognize that it is, as it says, a diseased body which must be held back to health. And he's got a problem because he's looking at the revolutionary French, and not long after that, a certain other Frenchman. Now, he finds a doctor for his army, one Gerhard von Scharnhorst. Now, Scharnhorst has a couple of advantages when it comes to fixing things Prussian. First of all, he's not Prussian. He's from Hanover, off to the west and north. Uh, from Brandenburg, and when he's born and through most of his early life, his ruler is actually George III, because at this point, uh, the king of uh, England is also still the elector of Hanover. Secondly, he's not from the nobility. When he's born, he's not a Vaughn at all. He's Gerhard Scharnhorst. His father is a tenant farmer who had been an NCO in the Hanoverian army. But the, the farmer acquires money and land over time and is able to get young Gerhardt into a cadet school. He graduates, gets a commission in the Hanoverian Army, and serves there, serves there for 20 years. Of course, this is the period of uh, revolutionary France. He actually is in the field against French, French revolutionary armies. He watches what goes on in France and begins to think and to write. He produces a number of different uh, works on things that militaries should do to improve their efficiency. He runs a couple of uh, periodicals over time and gets a reputation through a good chunk of Europe, particularly the German-speaking part, as being a military thinker and reformer. Now, uh, progress up the ranks in the Hanoverian army is slow, and after 20 years, he's a major. But in 1801, the opportunity arises to transfer into the much bigger and uh, more uh, lucrative Prussian army. And Gar uh, Scharnhorst's uh, requests to the Prussians are, number one, 
promote me to lieutenant colonel with a considerable pay raise. Number two, raise me to the nobility, make me a Vaughn. And number three, put me in charge of reorganizing the Prussian army. He gets all three of them, transfers over, and begins to work. He establishes something called the Academy for Young Officiere, the Academy for Young Officers, uh, the first of the educational uh, steps that he takes to really inculcate a modern scientific view of the military and uh, Prussian officers. Secondly, he found something called the Militärische Gesellschaft, the Military Society, which is a discussion group composed of reform-minded officers of the Prussian army who want to talk about what they need to do to break the old way and to produce a much better, more modern army and a more effective one. And he also produces the concept of something called in German Bildung. Now, I find a number of different definitions of this word. It's hard to, to translate. But my best view of it, it talks about a lifelong responsibility for not only technical, but also ethical and moral self-improvement. Um, you know, most German words tend to be long and complicated and have a relatively simple translation in English. This is the other way around. This is a short, simple word in German that takes a long, long time to dis discuss completely in, in English. Now, he obviously doesn't get things done very quickly for the simple reason there's opposition. A lot of people who are afraid that some of his ideas are going to break the Junker chokehold on the officer corps, and that's not popular. Now, the first general staff actually is not his doing. One of the members of the uh, military Gesellschaft or on Karl von Massenbach, uh, finally manages to get an idea across uh, to King Friedrich Wilhelm that what we need to have is a staff of people who are thinking ahead about what the army may have to do. And in November of 1803, 21 different officers are put together in what they called brigades at the time, east looking at Russia, south at Austria, west at France. Uh, and they begin to work. Scharnhorst gets one of these. The only problem is you've still got the adjutant general's department working the old way. You still have the quartermaster general's department working the old way. And the result is organized disorder because nobody is quite sure who is supposed to be doing what and what authority everybody really has. And Friedrich Wilhelm II, uh, the third rather, being what he is, doesn't make any decisions uh, to make it any clearer. Now, Massenbach himself apparently is a very difficult man to work to deal with uh, and eventually sort of is shuffled off and disappears from history. Now, 1804, not long after this, that staff is established, this gentleman comes on the, the, uh, uh, the stage as the emperor of the French. And most of Europe is afraid of him. He's obviously demonstrated a lot of military capability up to now, and it's obvious that he wants France to dominate Europe. So a coalition is put together. Austria, Russia, England at sea, uh, and sort of, kind of, Prussia. Again, the uh, lack of determined, determined uh, behavior on the part of the king and they come together to try and take him down. What happens is that at Ulm and at Austerlitz at the end of 1805, the Russians and the Austrians are decisively defeated. The Russians have to retreat all the way back into Russia. Austria is forced to sign a treaty that, among other things, dissolves the Holy Roman Empire that had been around for a thousand years. Prussia had been getting ready to get in on it when these two battles occur. And they don't quite make it in time. But Napoleon still knows that they're going, and he gets ready to come after Prussia. Now, Prussia mobilizes. They think they're going to take him on. There's a great deal of confidence in the Prussian army. After all, they're 
you know, quarter of a century before they were the number one in everything. Scharnhorst becomes the chief of staff to the Duke of Brunswick, who is the Prussian field commander. His comment about Prussian plans are, I know what should be done, but God knows if we will do it. No prizes for figuring out that they didn't do it. They approach things the way Frederick would have, and at Jena in 1806, Rene Jena Auerstadt, they're not only defeated, the Prussian army is crushed. It is scattered to the four winds. It's as decisive a lost loss as any army has had up to that time. Uh, Brunswick himself is killed. Scharnhorst uh, takes a mild wound, but he falls in with a cavalry command that's retreating under the command of one Gephard von Blucher. Now, Blucher's description in most of his uh, auto- in most of his biographies is a very rough, coarse, ill-educated man, but a very dynamic and charismatic leader. Scharnhorst attaches himself to Blucher and basically becomes his chief of staff. And Blucher discovers that he likes it. He likes it a lot. He can be the charismatic leader, where Scharnhorst takes care of a lot of the detail work that would otherwise take up a lot of Blucher's time. They retreat of being pursued by the French, make it almost all the way to the Baltic before they finally run out of ammunition and have to surrender. Now, fortunately for Prussia, both Blucher and Scharnhorst are shortly thereafter exchanged. And when Scharnhorst gets back in 1807 as a major general, he's made the chief of a military reorganization committee. The king has figured out that his army needs to be fixed badly. 1808, the officer corps is opened up up to all elements of Prussian society. There are educational requirements, however, that mean that only the most wealthy and educated elements of anything but the Junkers will be able to be officers. And there's a lot of resistance to letting uh, these bourgeois people into the officer corps. So officially opening it and actually effectively open it, opening it takes a while. There is a major reduction in force of the Prussian officer corps. Out of 142 generals in 1806, 100 of them are either cashiered or allowed to retire. And many more disappear in the, in the endure ensuing several years. Overall, over 800 officers are dismissed. Part of that is because Napoleon forces a reduction in the size of the Prussian army from about 200,000 to 42,000, but a lot of them are gone because the old, I'm a Junker and I'm an officer and I can't be pushed out, they actually can be pushed out. The conscription system is revised. It had previously been long-term dis- uh, conscription, relatively limited numbers. Uh, now the conscription extends over the entire population, and he wants to establish a reserve system. That gets a little hard to do because the king thinks that reserves might be a potential area where revolutionaries could get involved. But he works on it. There is something called the Krumper system. Now, your army has been reduced to a quarter or less of what it was. So what you're trying to do is to set yourself up with the ability to expand quickly later. What it amounts to is that in intervals, several soldiers in each company are put on long-term furlough. They're replaced with new recruits who are trained. A bit later, others are put on furlough, new recruits come in for training, and you're building up a combination of veterans who are on furlough and at least partially trained recruits who are released back into the population that can later be brought in and brought up to to snuff in a hurry. This is the core of his beliefs, though. Well-instructed, theoretically, and practically educated and train general staff. 
You have to have that. Scharnhorst is really the father of the German of the German general staff. And in 1810, a new Kriegsschule is founded. Uh, you'll see it cited as either the Offizier Kriegsschule, Officers Kriegs uh, uh, War School, or the Allgemeine, the General Kriegsschule. It continues all the way through and uh, survives, actually, uh, the end of World War I and goes on into World War II under different names. Finally, 1813, in the time when another expansion of the Prussian army is going on, a new decree from the king requires that every major field command have a properly qualified chief of staff attached to the commander. Scharnhorst recognized that he was not going to break the grip of the senior nobility on the upper command uh, echelons of the Prussian army. You know, the big commanders are going to be members of the king's family, uh, some, some, some of them from the great families of the nobility. But what he could do is to ensure that each of those commanders, who may or may not be good at their job, has a qualified officer backing him up and hopefully providing a degree of good sense that sometimes was lacking in the royal and noble commanders. 1809, a war ministry is established. The king allows this to happen, uh, but he doesn't like the idea. He feels that it's between him and the army. So for a number of years, he doesn't appoint a minister. But the general department goes to Scharnhorst. Personnel, first division. The second division, I've got general staff and parents because it doesn't have that title yet, but it has that function. And the third division is basically ordnance. Now, this continues. And it stays in existence all the way to uh, the begin, rather into uh, World War II. Now, 1812, of course, Napoleon uh, makes his great strive into Russia. He requires uh, Russia, which was pretty well under French thumb at that point, to provide a an infantry corps for his Grande Armée. Now, fortunately for Prussia, that corps gets used primarily as a left flank guard uh, going along the Baltic. It basically doesn't get much further than Riga. It doesn't go all the way into Russia with the rest of them, and therefore doesn't suffer the disaster that so many of the other non-French organizations uh, suffer. And on the way out, the commander of that corps basically says, I've had enough of this, and he changes sides. Signs an agreement with the Russians and becomes part of the Russian army. This more or less forces uh, Friedrich Wilhelm's hand. He's been terrified that France is going to finish dismembering Prussia. Already, the Napoleon has already taken major pieces of land from Prussia. Uh, but he doesn't have much choice now but to go along with, let's get uh, Napoleon. Now, Napoleon, of course, goes all the way back to France, manages to raise new armies. But the Prussian army has to expand and do so rapidly. In January of 1813, when Friedrich Wilhelm makes up his mind finally, the army's 42,000, as limited by Napoleon. By March, it's 130,000. And by August, it's 270,000. Now, he gets it that way by recalling those furloughed veterans, using those crumper system trainees. Conscription becomes national and universal. He forms a Landwehr, which is an, a militia, uh, a people's militia, more or less. And the officer corps is open to non-titled candidates. Now they can get in a lot more quickly than they could before. Uh, there is resistance to them later, and when the army has kind of collapsed a bit after uh, going after Napoleon, many of them are forced out, but the doors have been opened. Unfortunately for Prussia, Scharnhorst is wounded in the early fighting with uh, Napoleon. The wound goes septic, and he dies in June of 1813. But by then, there is a considerable body of his 
uh, acolytes and followers who have been trained in the school of Scharnhorst, and they are throughout the Polish army. Now, late fall uh, 1813, another coalition has been formed consisting of Russia, Prussia, Austria, Sweden, which is still a considerable military power then, and uh, England at sea primarily. They succeed in defeating Napoleon at the Battle of Leipzig, the so-called Battle of the Nations. What's interesting is that the Prussian army has a Scharnhorst-trained chief of staff. It's commanded by Blücher, by the way. The uh, Swedish army to the north has a Scharnhorst-trained chief of staff, a Prussian. Uh, the Russian army doesn't have a specific uh, trained chief of staff, but it has a number of Scharnhorst trained officers as liaison officers. The Austrians have a chief of staff, although he's not Scharnhorst trained. The idea is spreading uh, through the various different armies. Uh, by the way, the three standing characters in this painting from the left are the Tsar, the Austrian Kaiser, and the uh, King of Prussia, none of whom were actually together in one place on the battlefield at any one time, but it makes a nice painting. Now, Napoleon is forced to abdicate, goes off to Elba, doesn't stay quiet, comes back, 1815. The uh, Prussian army has to be reconstituted. And for the Waterloo campaign, the commander is, guess who? Old Blücher again. This time, his chief of staff is one August von Gneisenau, one of Scharnhorst's most fervent followers and a very, very active character. And together, they really make the Prussian army a pretty efficient and effective tool. And Eisenhower is actually the individual who decides before Waterloo that after a defeat by Napoleon a couple of days before, the Prussian army is not going to retreat back to Prussia, but head for the battlefield of Waterloo. Uh, Blücher had been knocked out by a near miss, uh, and uh, he eventually recovers. And, of course, we know the results of Waterloo. Now, later on, uh, it's announced that the University of Oxford is going to make Blücher an honorary doctor. His comment at the time was, in that case, they made to, need to make Gneisenau an honorary apothecary because if I wrote the prescription, he made the pills. Blücher and Scharnhorst, Blücher and Gneisenau are the earliest models of the Commander-Chief of Staff relationship becomes characteristic of the German army uh, throughout all the way to, in some ways, the modern day. Now, after Napoleon, the Prussian army tends to rest on its laurels. Uh, Gneisenau is a bit too much of a reformer for some of the conservative elements in uh, Prussian society. He eventually, fairly quickly, gets pushed to one side. He's given a nice, uh, safe job as governor of Berlin. Uh, but otherwise, the army just takes it easy for a while. Now, in 1872, the official name, excuse me, 1817, the official name of the general staff uh, comes in for the second division. In 1821, it's split off from the war ministry, gets an independent existence. Uh, the Kriegsschule continues throughout this period, and that may be the most important single thing relative to the general staff, because there isn't any real war planning going on. Nobody sees the need for a war coming up, which means that this general staff planning agency uh, doesn't really get much in the way of attention or influence. But the training of officers in the pattern established by Scharnhorst continues. They institute staff rides where students go out on the ground, look at it, they discuss and come up with tactical uh, solutions. Kriegspiele, war games, either tabletop or uh, in a sand table are introduced. There's one anecdote where a Prussian officer is trying to explain Kriegspiele uh, to some Austrian senior commanders, 
all of whom are, of course, great members of the great nobility. And the Austrians asked, well, how do you get points and bet on it? And then the Prussian says, well, that's not the reason, to which the Austrians say, well, why bother? Uh, which may tell more stories about the Austrian army than it does the Prussian. The geographic and mapping section is considerably enhanced, by the way, and it continues to be a, a hotbed of uh, middle-class officers coming in. And interestingly, a lot of middle-class officers, non-titled officers at least, come into the Army in the artillery because it involves mathematics. And again, that's somewhat below the uh, interest level of a true Junker. Uh, interesting also that uh, they are not as much concerned about middle class officers in the light forces, the hussars in the cavalry and the Jaegers in the infantry. Again, it's the socially prominent regiments that are the uh, domain of the Junker. Now, Karl von Clausewitz, the name was going to be familiar to pretty much anybody was one of the very early students of Scharnhorst. He has his early troubles, but manages to get through the uh, Kriegsschule uh, domain and barely reflects a very high degree of intelligence. Uh, after Jena, he is disgusted with the conduct of the Prussian king. He goes off and serves with the Russians. And during... Uh, uh, Napoleon's campaign, he, in fact, was one of the people who convinced the um, Prussian corps commander to change sides. In the period after uh, the battle, uh, he becomes the commandant of the Kriegsschule. So throughout the most of the first quarter of the, the second quarter, rather, of the uh, 18th century, this is the guy who's educating the Prussian officers. Now, in 1830, there is a flare-up in what had once been uh, an independent Poland and the Russian part of it. The Russians send in an army to suppress the rebellion. Uh, the Prussian court gets nervous. At this point, the king is Friedrich Wilhelm IV, who is no more decisive than his uh, father was. But they have to send an army out there to keep an eye on things. They're looking around for a commander, and they reactivate Gneisenau, who gets sent out to Königsberg with an army of observation. He asks for Clausewitz to come out as his chief of staff. Unfortunately for Prussia, while they're out there, both men contract cholera and die. Now, Clausewitz had written a lot of things in many forms. But before his death, none of it had ever been published. His wife, Maria, who seems to have almost worship the man, collects it together and puts it together in a book, Zum Krieg, on war. Now, this thing still gets read, and it's almost worshipped uh, in many circles. Personally, I find it a mixed bag. There's good stuff in Clausewitz. There's also stuff that is kind of entirely too much German philos uh, philosopher writing for me. And there's stuff in there that is basically just recapping 18th century wars. It's not what I would call a coherent, consistent study of war. So it's, it's gems hidden amongst a bunch of other stuff. This is the cover of what I think is probably the best available translation of it, Howard and Peter Parrott. There are many others around there. I just ran across another one today for the first time in a catalog. Uh, if you're interested, go buy it. You'll find Clausewitz's bust at the Army War College. Now, in 1848, there is a liberal rebellion throughout a good part of uh, Europe. Rebellion in Berlin. The king panics, puts on the colors of the, re the rebels, agrees to a new constitution, which would have radically changed the way the army was governed, almost causes the army to have a 
military coup. Eventually, 20,000 troops do enter Berlin, and they put the rebellion down uh, rather vigorously and bloodily. The king reneges on his initial promise of a constitution, but he does in fact give a constitution in 1850 that establishes a Reichstag, a legislature, uh, and uh, does some other things that are reasonably liberal for the day, but it doesn't change the relationship of the king to the army. That, I think, would not have been allowed. Shortly thereafter, three men come on the scene who are going to totally transform the Prussian army, and again, and, and as further to extension, the entire Prussian state and turn it into the German Empire. The first is Helmut von Moltke. He becomes chief of the general staff in 1857, when it's still something of a sleepy black water backwater. He changes it completely, inflicts it with new uh, energy, uh, changes its uh, orientation considerably, and in general turns it into something very powerful and very effective. The second is Albrecht von Roon. He becomes the war minister in 1859. He has seen the state of the Prussian army up to that point and is not happy with it. He gets called the Iron War Minister later, rams through many expansions and changes, improves discipline, training, organization, uh, weaponry, turns it into a much more modern and effective instrument. And then finally, Otto von Bismarck. He becomes the Prussian Minister President in 1862. And he is the consummate diplomat and politician. Basically, Arun builds the instrument. Bismarck decides what to do with it. And Moltke executes that particular mission. Now, Moltke holds the job for 31 years, a record. Uh, he actually comes from a typically impoverished a noble background, but his father had actually been a Danish general, and his initial military career was in the Danish army, but he transfers to the Prussians, very common and easy to do in those days. Comes up through the ranks. As a relatively junior general, he is given the position of chief of the general staff, which is an indicator of perhaps how the general staff was looked at in 1857. But he's a very powerful intellect. The man is a driving force, reorganizes the staff, infuses it with new strength, with new impetus, with new ideas and new missions, and basically sets up for what is going to be the general staff that becomes so admired uh, for its efficiency and effectiveness later on. He's also a bit of a uh, departure from the typical uh, Prussian officer. He's an author, writes travel books, writes a couple of other kinds of books, and does so rather prolifically. Uh, it is said that he speaks five languages, but can be silent in all five of them. And sometimes you really don't want him to speak to you. Uh, he looks at the problem that Germany has had almost since its inception, which is surrounded by potential enemies with no particular good defensive terrain on any border. And his life throughout the time he's in the general staff is devoted to coping with the problems that that brings. Now, the staff that he builds looks like this. The chief of the general staff and there's the quartermaster general again. This time, his role is the deputy to the chief of the general staff. Uh, he chooses to organize geographically. Each of the various generals, staff chiefs who have been along have changed the organization to suit them. Got an Easter depart department, primary emphasis is Russia. Still looks at uh, Sweden and Turkey. The German department looks at Austria and the other German states, 
remembering that at this point, there is not a unified German state at all. The Western Department, primarily France, but also the Brits, uh, Dutch, Belgians, Spanish, and the Americans, probably in that order of importance. Significantly, he establishes a railroad department. He's the first of them who recognizes the importance that railways are going to have to move troops and equipment and supplies around. Uh, it also is another thing that makes him a standout from other Prussian officers. He begins to invest in German railroads long before he gets into this position, so that by the time he becomes the chief of the general staff, he's that very unusual character, a well-to-do staff officer. He also establishes a military history department. Now, when he takes it over, the staff is 30, 35 officers. He builds it up, never gets huge, never anything like as big as you might expect. Uh, by the time we get into the wars of, uh, of the consolidation later on, we're looking at maybe 60 officers in the staff. But he firmly believes in giving general direction and expecting subordinates to be smart enough and well enough trained to be able to take that general direction and turn it into actions that support what he wants done. Now, the wars of unification uh, are the place that makes the general staff, the, the period. In 1864, Prussia and Austria declare war on Denmark over control of the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein. Uh, initially, the Prussian uh, contingent is commanded by a field marshal named Wrangel, who had cut his initial military teeth against Napoleon. Uh, he's rather long in the tooth at this point, and his comment about taking anybody from the general staff with him is that it's shameful for the idea that a Prussian field marshal should need to have a bunch of clerks with him. So Mutka and the general staff stay in Berlin initially. They had offered a number of plans for dealing with the Danes. The Prussians and Austrians have some initial success. The Austrians actually better than the Prussians. Uh, things uh, begin to slow down a bit and it becomes obvious that Wrangel is really not up to it. He is relieved and replaced with, guess what, a Hohenzollern prince uh, named Friedrich Karl. Now, Moltke is brought out as his chief of staff with plans that prove to be very effective in finishing the Danes off. By two years later, it's obvious to everybody that Moltke knows what he's doing. The general staff is still not as well known amongst the army as a whole as it is amongst the uh, king's court and senior commanders, uh, to the point that later on uh, during the war of 1866 with Austria, there's one incident where a Prussian general gets an order, says, this looks fine, and, and but who is this General Moltke who's signing it? Now, in 1866, Bismarck engineers a war with Austria designed to knock Austria out of its dominant position in German affairs. Very, very quickly, five sets of instructions go out from the general staff to German army, to Prussian armies, that converge and at a place called Königgrätz, administer a decisive defeat to the Austrian army. Now, here's one of the problems that comes up, though. Moltke's Im de uh, Im desire is to charge ahead and occupy Vienna. Bismarck, who is the chancellor by this point, the uh, minister president, says no. We don't want to hurt Austria so badly that they become an abject enemy to us. They're defeated. They have to accept what we tell them to do but we don't want to humiliate them. And we run into the problem of 
the fact that the general staff follows some of the ideas out of Clausewitz, which are basically that war means total war. You take it as far as you can possibly take it. The diplomat and politician in Bismarck, however, limits that. And it's a continuous back and forth between the general staff and Bismarck as long as Bismarck is there. Now, by 1870, Bismarck wants to take France out. He has made good uh, relations with Austria, a matter, I mean, with uh, Russia, a matter of importance. So they're not a problem. But France, under Napoleon III, is. And at this point, it's entirely obvious that all the planning is going to be out of the general staff and out of uh, Mutke's hands. Obviously, the, the front defeat of France in 1870 uh, gets Mutke promotion in the nobility, uh, gets him a rank of general field marshal, uh, gets a lot of the other generals who take part all sorts of honors. And in 1871, results in the declaration of the German Empire with King Wilhelm I becoming Kaiser Wilhelm I. It is apparent to everybody in Prussia that uh, the, the general staff is a dominant organization. Everybody else in Europe looks at it and begins to copy it in one way or another. The Prussian army gets copied to the point that the U.S. Army is wearing spiked helmets for a while in the 1870s. The ideas spread rapidly because they're effective and they work in a way that nobody anticipated they ever would. Now, one of the concepts, Auftragstaktik, currently translated in the U.S. military as mission command. It's hard to translate, but it basically says you tell a subordinate what you want him to do, then let him go ahead and do it in the belief that his training and his capabilities will lead him to do things that support the senior commander's intent. And Moltke believed in general direction, not in detailed management of the uh, of his subordinates. It's difficult to do, easy to talk about, but in many, many cases, the uh, desire to make sure the guy knows exactly what you want him to do, when and where, can be overwhelming. Now, Moltke tries earlier in the uh, earlier than 1888 when he retires to retire. He's basically told, no, you're indispensable. Finally, in 1888, the man is nearing 90, and he is allowed to go off and spend his last few years in retirement. This man takes over, Alfred von Valdese. He was the quartermaster general for some time, and he's a real outlier when it comes to chiefs of the general staff because he likes politics and wants to dabble in them. He establishes a press bureau in the general staff, including several retired officers who write uh, articles for him attacking his enemies. He believes in uh, uh, having preventative wars and advocates attacking both France and Russia uh, to make sure that they can't build up the strength to threaten uh, Germany again. At this point, Austria has become pretty much of an ally. Now, the problem with Valdese is he thinks more of himself than most other people do, and he dabbles and fiddles and tries to dip his finger in politics. In 1890, the new Kaiser, Wilhelm II, gets rid of Bismarck. And for a little while, Valdese had his eyes on the chancellor's office, not realizing that Wilhelm has no intentions of giving him that office. And he also commits the cardinal sin. Well, every fall, the German army had a huge core-on-core opposed maneuver called the Kaiser Maneuver. And Valdese 
made the mistake of criticizing the Kaiser's tactical solution to one of the problems. Shortly thereafter, he's trundled off and sent away to a corps command, and we really don't hear from him again. He is replaced by Alfred von Schlieffen. Von Schlieffen is a reversal to the actual archetype of the general staff officer. He has no interest in anything but military science. There is a story that at one time they were on a trip and one of his aides pointed out a particular lovely piece of the Alpine uh, valley, Valley. He looked at it and said a minor obstacle and went back to whatever else he was doing. Now, Schlieffen has a real problem because Wilhelm II manages to sacrifice the good relations between Germany and Russia that uh, Bismarck had maintained for a long time. So now Germany has the threat of a two-front war against Russia and France simultaneously. And he spends most of his time in office trying to deal with how to handle this. Against France, he looks at prohibitive early attacks. He looks at attacks that are going to wait until the the French attack first and then counterattack. He seems never to actively think about something like uh, going through uh, Belgium until a little bit later when it becomes obvious to him that That may be the way to take care of this problem. The solution he comes up with is don't fight a two-front war, fight two one-front wars. Now, Moltke had discussed the same thing. And Moltke had uh, advocated uh, maneuver offensively, fight defensively, because he had first recognized uh, the growing impact of technology changes uh, on warfare although that concept didn't really percolate the way down through the Prussian army, particularly particularly uh, with relation to tactics. But von Schlieffen develops a series of plans which call for basically a holding action against Russia and the famous right hook through Belgium uh, against France. The problem is that in no time do any of his concepts ever really have all of the forces that they need to have. You need several additional corps that don't exist in the Prussian army to be able to do exactly what he wants. Now, by 1906, many of the ideas have solidified. Russia has lost the the, the, the Russo-Japanese war. They're not in very good shape at all. He's a lot more confident that he can take France out first and then not worry about the Russians until later. Uh, He doesn't understand at that point how quickly Russia is going to recover, particularly with a lot of French and British uh, money backing them up. But like all Prussian commanders, and this is something that's endemic to the Prussian army, is a belief that you have to win in a hurry. Russia can't stand, the Russian Empire can't stand a long-term war for the simple reason it doesn't have the resources at home compared to the combined power of its potential opponents. That's why the quick strike through Belgium into France becomes absolutely essential. Now, the people that he is working with and that have all been working with throughout history come from the Kriegs Academy. They are the successors of the old Allgemeine Kriegsschule. That's its building in Berlin. And the general staff students are drawn from throughout the German army. These are students from the class of 1910-12. The one civilian in there is probably a professor from the University of Berlin, Berlin, and they appear to be studying geometry and mathematics. If you have at least five years service in the Prussian, the German army, you can apply for the academy. About a hundred 
actually pass the entry exam. They enter a three-year-long uh, course of study with breaks every summer, some of which are used for staff rides, some of which actually are to give the students a chance to rest. At the end of that year, only about 30 actually pass the final exam. Some of them have fallen beside the wayside. Some just don't pass the exam. Doesn't mean they're wastage. They're still well-trained and they can be made very good use of in troop units, but they're not going to be concerned. They're not going to be allowed into the great general staff itself. They go on a one to two year probationary period, mixed assignments with uh, troop units and with the great general staff. At the end of it, five to eight become permanent general staff officers. It's probably the most selective educational process of any military, any place at any time. Now, they then undergo a long period of rotations between troop units and being on the great general staff. Now, general staff officers are just distinguished in their uniform. I went nuts for a while trying to find a good picture of a general staff uniform until I realized we had one down in the Bergman Gallery. That bright red stripe on the trouser leg is the distinguishing mark of a general staff officer. It's called carmine red. They also get the red backing to the collar. They are a separate caste in the Army, very much aware of their position. They have a high level of technical skills very high level of technical skills, and they're trained to common methods and outlooks. Uh, ideally, if you give two general staff officers exactly the same problem, they'll come up with the same solution. Doesn't work that way, obviously, but you can come close, surprising at times. They're supposed to be self-effacing. Schlieffen's comment is that a general staff officer has no face. You don't ever upstage the boss. Very limited interest in non-military subjects. And as time goes on, that becomes more the case, simply because as war became more technical, well, there's an old joke about an expert being someone who knows more and more about less and less till they know everything about nothing. It's the struggle that the general staff, staff officers had. There was so much to learn in the military field that knowing anything else was difficult to impossible. They tended to be target fixated. War was the objective. War was what they were good at. War was what they were going to do. They were apolitical, I say, to a fault. They were not allowed to be members of political parties. They weren't supposed to vote. They weren't supposed to take part in anything like debates in the newspapers. But being, being apolitical also meant they were often terribly ignorant of politics, ignorant of the fact that society was changing around them and things were not always going to be where they were. Their belief was this quote from Clausewitz, war is an act of force to compel the enemy to do our will. That's what we're good at. That's what we're going to do. But there's another quote from Clausewitz. The political object is the goal. War is the means of reaching it, and means can never be considered in isolation from their goal. And very often they didn't keep their eyes on the goal, they just kept their eyes on the means. Schlieffen retires in 1906. There is a, a story, probably apocryphal, that his last words were just keep the right strong, meaning the right wing going through Belgium. And there's a debate amongst historians, was it a Schlieffen plan, a Schlieffen idea, a Schlieffen concept, a Schlieffen memo? You know, what was it? In any case, Helmut von Moltke, the younger, who is the nephew of the original Moltke, takes over in 1906. Uh, he's a competent officer, but one who doesn't have a great deal of confidence uh, that he's the right man for the job. But as far as Kaiser Wilhelm is concerned, he's the right man for the job because Wilhelm is comfortable with him and he's not comfortable with a number of the other candidates for the position. Now, Mulka takes the Schlieffen concept 
And it remains the basic idea that the general staff works with uh, up until the start of the war. He fiddles with numbers. He has to. Uh, there's pressure to put more protection in Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, he thinks perhaps there's not enough space in Belgium to put as much strength through as Mulke as their other uh, Schlieffen was going to use. It's a continuous problem. The war starts, and the plan doesn't go as expected. Fairly quickly uh, on, Mulke loses faith that they can even win the war because he's lost that fast victory that is so central to Prussian, to Russian, I mean to uh, Prussian and German military thinking. His health kind of breaks down, and in September of 1914, he is relieved. General staff that he'd started the war with looks like this, a lot more complicated than it was before. You've got the, the chief and the quartermaster general, you now have five Oberquartiermeister, and they run chunks of these departments. Uh, there are geographic departments who seem primarily have been concerned with looking at capabilities and actions. The operations department is the one that forms the core of what becomes the Oberheeresleitung, the Supreme Army Command. And by 1914, the railroad department down there at the bottom is by far the largest single one. And it's manned almost entirely by non-noble officers. Gee, what a surprise. Now, up until about 1912, it had been more or less accepted that in the event of war, the Kaiser was going to himself take the field as the supreme commander. He was going to be the Opus de Kriegsherr. In 1912, he has an interview with a British correspondent that produces an article that just causes a firestorm of criticism, not just in Britain, but also in Germany, to the point that he contemplates abdication, takes to his, chair, his bed for a period of time in a fit of depression. And from that point on, well, the general staff is going to go to the field as the Oberheeresleitung, the Army Supreme Command. And while the chief of the general staff may just have the title of chief of staff, he's pretty well accepted he's going to be the actual commander. The Kaiser becomes, at that point, a figurehead. He's out there to cheer on and rah-rah, but the direction is going to be in the hands of the chief of the general staff. Now, what does that chief of staff have power to do? First of all, commander decisions are supposed to be taken jointly with the chief of staff. And if the chief of staff doesn't agree with something the commander plans to do, he has direct access to the next higher chief of staff without asking permission. And he can actually object in writing to a decision of his commander if he thinks it's bad enough. Uh, that threat alone is enough to make most commanders think twice about bucking their chiefs of staff. Uh, and in a number of areas at the start of the war, most particularly the army that was given to the German crown prince Wilhelm, he was basically told, listen to your chief of staff and do what he tells you. It's the classic royal commander with the chief of staff doing most of the work. There's the concept of Vollmacht, which is purely German. But on occasion, the chief of staff, or sometimes a lesser staff officer, can be given Vollmacht, which is the complete power to issue orders as if they were ordered, issued by the commander. It's not the U.S. Army's for the commander signature line. It's an actual order on behalf of the chief of staff or whoever else is given Volma. Something else which is quite different in the Russian and German system is that position often counted more than rank. And this occurs throughout the whole German army. Uh, the man who was in charge of clandestine intelligence 
for the German army at the start of World War I was a major a man named Nikolai. Uh, the man who ran the, the, uh, most of the, the gas program for the German army was a captain. In many cases, chiefs of staff might be considerably lower in rank than the commanders of subordinate units, but the commanders of the subordinate units still did as they were told by the chief of staff. Sometimes you have the recognized specialist, and the classic of that is one Fritz von Losberg. As a colonel, he is recognized for his capabilities in organizing and running the defense. And in the course of World War I, he is assigned as the chief of staff, as a colonel, and eventually as a major general, which is a one-star position in the German army, uh, as the chief of staff of five different armies. Every time the uh, Oberheeresleitung recognizes that a particular army is likely to be the recipient of a major Allied attack, Lossberg goes in, replaces the other chief of staff, and reorganizes things to the best defensive capability. But he shows up as a colonel, uh, recognizing that in some of these armies, many of the other staff officers are generals, but they're all perfectly happy to obey orders from him. It's a very German thing to do. Now, in 1914, when Mutke the Younger goes away, he's replaced by Erich von, von Falkenhayn. Falkenhayn had been a war minister, and for the first several months of the war, he keeps both positions. The only time in German history that that happens. Uh, when it's split off again, the man who takes over the war ministry uh, had just been Falkenhayn's uh, quartermaster general, so it was still very much under Falkenhayn's control. Now, I'm not going to go into all the military stuff Falkenhayn does. That's a whole different presentation. But in terms of the staff actions, what he finds himself doing is facing almost a rebellion from the commanders and staff on the Eastern Front. Falkenhayn believes that the Western Front is going to be the decisive one. But a couple of characters that we'll run into in a minute uh, espouse the belief that it's the Eastern Front. And there's a continual problem back and forth between them. Falkenhayn can never quite organize a winning strategy on the Western Front. Uh, they do get very much progress on the Eastern Front. Uh, and eventually, these two appear. Von Hindenburg becomes the chief of the general staff, replacing Falkenhayn, who is sent off to command an army in the Balkans and does very well. And Erich Ludendorff. They're both trained general staff officers. The relationship between these two uh, deserves a presentation by itself. Just as, an, as a more or less quick summary, Hindenburg supplies the gravitas, uh, the leadership ability, and the calmness that a headquarters needed. Ludendorff is the almost frenetic workaholic who believes that he's really the, uh, the power behind uh, the von Hindenburg uh, figurehead. Uh, interestingly, Ludendorff accumulates a lot of power over time. And to give him credit, it's never something that he does for personal gain. His rank is never higher than General der Infantry, a three-star. And even after the war, uh, he refuses at one point the uh, Kaiser's offer to ennoble him. Doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Now, the biggest thing about Ludendorff in particular, with Hindenburg's help in many cases, is that he dies into politics in a way that nobody else in the general staff had ever had, even Valdezay. Uh, that's a quote, one thing was certain, the power must be hand, in my hands, that comes from a post-war uh, writing by Ludendorff. And the important word there is my hands. He is reported to have said at one time or another that when I won the Battle of Tannenberg, 
which of course is what gets uh, Hindenburg his field marshal at Bataan. And he de- goes into almost uh, overwhelming, overheated efforts to try and make things work better because he believes that politics must serve total war. Both he and Hindenburg see no alternative to war. They're believers in total war as it comes out of Clausewitz, and they don't see any reason that there should be any kind of uh, attempt to do anything but have war. Uh, Later on in his post-war writings, Ludendorff condemns Christianity because it's a religion of peace. There is something called the Hindenburg Program that they put into uh, effect shortly after moving uh, to take control. Basically, it's an attempt to sharply increase the production of war materials, ammunition, and so forth uh, in Germany without paying much attention to what the disruption everything else in the German economy is. There is a new law called the Hilfsdienstgesetz, the Auxiliary Service Law, in December of 1916. That is a law which basically says that every German male between the ages of 17 and 60 must be involved in war work, one way or the other. As they come out of other parts of society, they'll be replaced by women. They'll be replaced by auxiliary workers coming from, oh, France and Belgium. Uh, They'll be replaced, perhaps, uh, by the better groups that we can find in Eastern Europe. Again, no attention paid to disruption at all. The only thing that matters is the war and winning the war. Uh, Now, at this point, the uh, Reichstag, the legislature, who had been staying quiet for a long time, begins to raise its head again. And they put all sorts of changes and exemptions and carve-outs in the law that means there are major parts of society that uh, avoid this. Nothing they try works particularly well. There are schemes to increase the birth rate, something that wouldn't help for another 20 years. They have a lot of opposition, the two of them, to Chancellor Bethman Holweg, because Bethman Holweg is willing to at least listen to things like some of the peace proposals from Woodrow Wilson. And they finally succeed in oops, in forcing him out and replacing him by a succession of about three additional uh, chancellors who are willing to just be quiet uh, and let them get on with the war. They have extravagant expansion schemes. In the East, they're going to take over huge swaths of what was Poland, what was Russia, Uh, They establish a new so-called kingdom of Poland with, of course, a German uh, king in control of it. It's a complete uh, puppet state uh, that makes it impossible for Russia to ever accept a separate peace, really. In the West, they say we're going to keep major chunks of of, uh, Belgium. Uh, Luxembourg is going to become a constituent state of the empire. Uh, We're going to take pieces of the French coast. We're going to keep the iron and coal mines of France that we have control of. And basically, we're just going to make sure that France never rises again. This continues, by the way, all the way to the end of the war, when they're still making comments, almost at the time of the uh, armistice, to the effect that Germany has sacrificed much in this war and must be compensated. They never seem to understand that nobody on the Allied side is going to take any of this sitting down. Now, they begin to ask for an armistice as early as September of 1918. Ludendorff kind of panics after that famous Black Day of the German army in August, and the Allies begin to push back all the way along the the front need to have an armistice, need to have an armistice. But unlike the civilian government, 
which is looking at an armistice as an end to fighting. Hindenburg and Ludendorff are looking at it as a breathing space, a time where they can pull the army back to more defensible lines, uh, reorganize, refit, get ready to go again. They, again, never understand the politics back home. This is the verdict of Hans Delbruck, German uh, historian who is generally regarded as the father of uh, modern military history, empire built by Mutke and Bismarck, destroyed by Tirpitz and Ludendorff. Tirpitz because of his insistence on the, on the expense of a huge fleet that Germany could never use. Now, Ludendorff goes before the armistice. He basically objects to the uh, Max von Baden, the chancellor of the day, right at the end of the war, uh, accepting most of what Wilson says in his final note about an armistice. which uh, essentially says we won't uh, negotiate with the army or with the Kaiser. Uh, when that comes out, Ludendorff sends a message out to the army uh, defiantly saying, no, uh, we'll fight on. Uh, the chancellor objects, and Ludendorff is forced to resign. Hindenburg tries to resign as well. The Kaiser won't accept it because Hindenburg is too much of a symbol. Ludendorff ends up living in his wife's uh, rented apartment in Berlin. He's replaced by one Wilhelm Gruner. Now, at the start of the war, Gruner had been the chief of the railway department of the general staff. He is a South German, not a Prussian, and he is basically in sympathy with the civilian government that comes in startling for a general staff officer. He comes in together with uh, Hindenburg. They check the opinions of the army about whether they'll continue to support the Kaiser, whether they could be used against the rioters back home. And the basic conclusion is no to both. Gruner is the guy that has to finally tell the Kaiser, uh, you know, the officer's oath to your majesty is simply a fiction now. So the Kaiser has to take off and leave. Gruner and Hindenburg both tell the civilian government, yes, a uh, armistice is needed, but neither of them participates in the process of negotiating or trying to negotiate the armistice. They won't have anything to do with it. Hindenburg walks out of the room. Anybody even raises the subject of the armistice. When they go to meet Bosch at Compiègne, there is a German general in the party, but he's not part of the general staff. He's a formal, uh, former attaché to France, and he speaks French. The general staff doesn't allow its fingerprints to be anywhere on the armistice. And it's one of the things that was used later on in the stab in the back story. Now, after the armistice, uh, the army goes home. And in the period between the time that they get home and finish putting down the rebellions at home and the uh, Treaty of Versailles, Gunner and Hindendorf and others are talking about, well, we'll have an army of someplace between uh, 200 and 400,000 will have this much aviation, will have this much artillery, so forth and so on. Shock horror? No. You're limited to an army of 100,000 in Treaty of Versailles. You can't have a general staff. You can't have artillery. You can't have aviation. You can't have submarines. Basically, you've got a constabulary force, and that's all you're left with. Gruner tries to do what he can with it for a little while. He finally retires and goes into politics. And in the aftermath, 
Well, there's a little joke about what happens to your lap when you stand up. It runs around the other side and hides under an assumed name. Well, the assumed name that the general staff takes up is the Truppenamt, which is put under this gentleman, one Hans von Seik. And it is the Truppenamt that holds the traditions of the general staff together and begins the work that allows Hitler in the 1930s to so swiftly expand the German army. Now, under Hitler, of course, the German general staff never really gets its power back because the, the Nazi approach is to keep things fragmented. But it was a tradition going back into the 17th century that went unbroken all the way to the end of World War II. And that, folks, is the end of the general staff as we know it. There is still a general staff in the German army, although it's considerably more of a NATO organization now. But general staff officers are still very specially trained and expected to be of a different quality than many other German officers. That's it, folks. Lee, thank you very much. That was a broad-brushed view at the uh, German general staff. And it's sort of easy to see why the Allies didn't want there to be any more German general staff. What is hard to believe is they actually thought they could get that done. They clearly had no realistic idea of what they could demand of Germany and what they couldn't demand of it. But that's something that goes all the way through the Versailles Peace Treaty, which is probably a topic for another day.